So the shoulder examination, okay, it's like any examination, is the most, what's the most important part of actually doing an examination? And it's a bit of a trick question here. I'm gonna shut the door for a sec. So we don't get too much. Trick question, is that, am I in the right spot again? I gotta... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So what's the most important part of examination? Really, the examination is done to help you get a diagnosis. And really, what's the most important part of making a diagnosis was taking a history, okay? So that, obviously, when we do an examination, the most important part is actually knowing the, the history, first of all. So you've got to take the history into account, all right? Not every, um, so without a history, the examination is a waste of time. The history is what helps you form the diagnosis, Examination helps you confirm the diagnosis, and then we do investigations to both back that up, the stage condition to help us determine treatment options and determine prognosis. Okay, so when we talk about the examination, it's only really part of the whole process. Okay, and the history is really important because the classic scenario is someone who presents with a stiff shoulder. If if one you use present with a stiff shoulder, it's more likely to be a frozen shoulder. While if a 75 year old lady presents with a stiff shoulder, it's more likely to be arthritis of the shoulder. Okay, so the number of times I've been referred a stiff shoulder uh, and there's no x-ray um, to help us um, confirm our diagnosis, then um, it really is effective because usually the GP will write a letter saying, see this lady with frozen shoulder, she's 75, try a steroid injection. And once you examine them, you confirm, yes, it is a stiff shoulder, but actually, you know, because she's 75, it's more likely to be an arthritic, arthritic shoulder. And then you get an x-ray and it shows it straight off. So. Um, really, the full history helps you determine your examination. So when you have, if you ever get an OSCE and says just go and examine something, it makes it really harder for you. You need that little bit of history. The same way with a, um, with a we've just been talking about hand and wrist conditions. Without knowing whether it's a neurological type symptom or pain, or whether it's a tend or whether it's actually a restricted motion, it makes it very hard to do the examination because there's so much to examine. The shoulders to some degree is like that too, so the history helps you a lot. What's really important is the age of the patient, like I've just mentioned, a younger person more likely to be a uh, tendonitis or a frozen shoulder, an older person more likely to be an arthritic condition. Okay? Now just briefly, and I'll go through this on Tuesday, but what are the conditions that can affect the shoulder? As with any shoulder, any, any, any area of the orthopedics, it can be the traumatic conditions, which are fractures, dislocations and infections, or it can be the elective conditions, which really are the specific conditions for that joint. And the, the main condition that affects the shoulder are the rotator cuff syndrome, okay? Bursitis, tendonitis, sec, um, tendon tears, and then secondary arthritis, okay? Or you can get frozen shoulder, where the shoulder stiffens up out of the blue, normally in the 20 to 50 year old age group, but it can be outside that group. I haven't seen too many young people, but certainly old, you can get older than that but usually 20 to 50 year old age group, or you can get a um, referred pain from the cervical spine, okay? Or you can get arthritis, okay? Osteo osteoarthritis, primary or secondary, or inflammatory arthritis, okay? So really there's not that many different shoulder conditions that occur, okay, to look for, okay? Now there's one other group of, of patients, the ones that fit in the middle. Remember I like to divide things into three, you've got your, pri you've got your traumatic presentations, you've got your elective presentations. The ones that fit in the middle are the instability patterns. They may present with this traumatic dislocation, but they've got recurrent instability, either they feel like sub subluxing joint, or they may feel like there's something goes when they go to throw something because the labrum's torn, or, or they have recurrent secondary, uh, recurrent instability, which becomes a chronic problem. So, so that's the th they're really all you get in the shoulder. And, that, and when I talk on Tuesday, I'll elaborate on that, but that's really all there is. So when we go to examine a shoulder, we need to know a bit of a history. Is it a traumatic presentation? Is it a younger person? Is it pain? Does it feel like it's unstable? And that will help us guide us on our examination. Okay. But our examination, my general shoulder examination, and I've done so many of them, it just falls into a routine now. I don't even realise I'm doing it. Is that first of all, most importantly, what's, when you walk into a room, what's the first thing you want to do? Wash your hands, okay? So you wash your hands, introduce yourself to the patient, show them respect, okay? And then after you've, you've taken the appropriate history, we do it, go to the examination, we're going to start. We're going to be looking at one of those, those, those conditions, okay? Now, I generally tend at the beginning, you'll see me in my clinic, just to check the neck out first of all. In an OSCE, you'd probably want to do it last of all because you're worried you might run out of time 
okay? And really, you don't want to miss out on the shoulder examination because you're too busy worrying about the neck when they've asked you to examine the shoulder. But I, I would generally tend to check out the neck because referred pain from the neck can classically go to the shoulder and present with pain here, maybe associated with some paresthesia in part of the fingers. And the best exam, it's always most one of the most specific tests. You do a, if you get them to do the, the, the three uh, axes of motion of the shoulder, extension, flexion, natural flexion, I'm a bit stiff anyway, and rotation, okay? Um, if that moves fine, then you think the neck's clear. As you get older, you get stiff like myself. But if you get a combination of extension, lateral flexion and rotation, and it says, shit, my hand's going numb, and you do that, I'm getting pain in my shoulder, and you're thinking, as you do that, the same with our friend here, you'll see on the frame and in the neck, as you extend the neck, it actually narrows that frame, and if that traps a nerve, that's going to lead to impingement in the hand. That test is called Sperling's test. But I, you know, in simple ways of saying it's neuroforaminal compression, and if that reproduces the symptoms, you're thinking it's coming from the neck. Okay, and it's quite common actually to get neck referred pain from the neck. Okay, so I would always check the neck. Either I do it at the beginning often, <coughs> but it could, I'd recommend an oscopy probably do it last because if you run out of time, they might say to you, "Got anything else you want to do?" And you say, "You would always check the neck out and go from there." Okay, then then we're going to start start with our shoulder examination. And as in the standard Apley's principles and orthopedic principles, we look, feel, and move. Okay? So, is anyone happy to be on TV? <laughs> I'm not going to get them undressed. Anyone happy to be a patient for a moment? Yeah. You're happy to come up? I'm pointing you because you're sitting in the back row you're trying to hide. Are you happy to be? Is, is, just yeah, yeah. Yeah, be, it might be, put on, might be put online, okay? Oh, that's all right. You okay? All right, so I'm going to stand over here. I'm going to move this chair back. Right, so obviously you'd normally disrobe the patient. We're not going to disrobe you, okay? All right. Okay, so when we look, we look from the directions. The first thing to do is watch body habitus. See, you look from the front. So I'm going to get come around this side and get your face that way. So look from the front, okay? And we look from the side and we look from the back, okay? If they're sitting, you can look from the top as well. But usually I prefer them standing, okay? And what are we looking at? I'm going to show on the left shoulder because that way it's better for the camera. Um, but basically, you're looking for the shape of the, of the clavicle, okay? The AC joint, the subacromial space, the supraspinatus fossa, and the actual structure of the, of, the, of the deltoid. So we can see, if you look in your own, your own shoulder in the mirror, when you look in there, you can see the clavicle coming from across, and you can see if there's any deformity, you can see if there's a step of the AC joint, you can see if there's any muscle wasting. And if you turn around the back, this area here, that's the supraspinatus fossa, and the infraspinatus fossa, that's looking for muscle wasting there, okay? Also, when you're looking at a patient, you're looking for scars too, okay? Or you can look for other things too for general illness, but when we're focusing on orthopedics, we'll just talk about that at this stage. Turn back this way. What's your name again? Uh, Tree. Tree. Oh, of course yeah. it's Tree, yeah. I met Tree the first, from the first yeah, days. And, first yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so we're looking at all those areas, okay? Now we're going to, and obviously if there's any deformity, you comment upon it, okay? Then we're going to feel, okay? Now you can do it at your own shoulder. Tree, you can do it yourself as well. You start at your sternoclavicular joint and work your way along the clavicle. You can feel that really quite nice. The good thing about shoulders, and in nearly every patient, no matter what the body habitus, tall, short, whatever size you are, your clavicle is usually quite fairly superficial and you feel every aspect of it, okay? So feel along your clavicle here, sternoclavicular across to the AC joint. The AC joint, just below the AC joint, is where the coracoid is, okay? And then you can feel just the edge, of, just behind the AC joint. Now, the AC joint you'll feel is a little bump. Okay, just before, we, before you get the edge of the chrome in, the AC joint's just there. If you play a lot of footy or do a lot of contact sports, that can get a bit degenerative, or also push-ups, a lot of push-ups can do it too, and you get a little extra bump there. That bump's quite handy for carrying your, your rucksack over your shoulder, you know, when you put your rucksack on, that's where it sends the sit, okay? Um, when you do an AC joint excision, by the way, that lump will disappear a bit, and that can be a thing that affects ladies, because that's where their bra strap will sit too, and um, so they might get a bit upset about that, so you need to warn them about the lump not being there. Um, but um, that's actually the AC joint, a chromium, okay? And you've got your subacromial space. So you can fill all those areas. Coracoid, and you feel the supraspinatus muscle bulk and the infraspinatus muscle bulk. Again, looking, feeling from all sides as well. Now, traditionally, you should do both. <coughs> In an OSCE, I'd say, usually they'll say just focus on one side because if you try and do both sides all the time, you just honestly waste your time. So generally, though, what I would do in my clinic was I'd look at this side and if there's any deformity or anything unusual, I'd check compared to the other side, all right? So we look, we feel, 
and we're looking for any of those sort of things. What might we, what might we see? Well, let's go back to our conditions, okay? All right. If there, was, if there had been a neck problem, we talked about that at the start, but also if there was a C5 nerve root, you could get muscle wasting here. But otherwise, when we're looking for muscle wasting, it's usually associated with rotator cuff tears or from lack of use, all right? So muscle atrophy, you're thinking of rotator cuff tears, all right? Deformity of the clavicle, you're thinking of fracture of the clavicle. Deformity of AC joint, you're thinking of AC joint dislocation or secondary AC joint arthritis, okay? Um, the, uh, what else could we see? See scars, that might be important if they've had surgery, okay? Um, when we're feeling, we're also feeling for, um, just trying to think. Um, oh, um, when we go to move, part of the feeling will be feeling for crepitus as well, okay? So they're the main things you're looking for. Any questions so far? Then we go to move, okay? Now move can be either active or passive, all right? So we do some active motion first of all, because first of all we can see how much comfort, he, we don't want to cause him discomfort, and secondly also want to see what we can do actively. Now, what makes the shoulder move? Well, it's the muscles, or it's the nerve that controls the muscles. So lack of use can be secondary to muscle inability, and the most common thing would be a tendon tear, or it could be from a C5 nerve root, okay, radiculopathy. So we go for motion. Now, I, I, I really struggle not to do this next step when I do when I get someone to move. I used to almost stop myself doing it, but when I say move, I always put my hand on the shoulder. All right, all right, and it's just it's just reflex. In fact, it's actually hard not to. It's like hopping in the car, and not putting your seatbelt on or something. All right, so you put your hand on the on the on the, on the shoulder, and we say, can you lift your arm straight up towards the ceiling? Okay. Now, when he does that, what I'm feeling for is crepitus in the shoulder, as well as I'm looking for the range of motion. And you put it down for a sec. Now I'll just go back and do that slowly. But when I'm feeling for crepitus, there's a couple of different types of crepitus. You can get like a soft tissue crepitus, which can be associated with just tendonitis in the shoulder, or you can get a bony, crunchy crepitus, which is arthritis, okay? Now, we talked about arthritis being more common in the older person, but of course you can get secondary arthritis from infections and things. So if you had a, if you had a septic arthritis, that could lead to secondary arthritis, or um, yeah, I think tuberculosis can be associated with tuberculosis nodules and things like that can be associated with some secondary arthritis as well. So, but really, you're thinking in a younger person, if I felt crepitus, I'd be thinking it's more tendonitis, okay? So where he goes, and he lifts his arm straight up to the ceiling, you go all the way up as high as you can go. Now, turn the side onto the guys. You see, so that's 180 degrees, zero. Just like a protractor, okay? So we measure it that way. So he's going up to 170 degrees at least, down, okay? And if he got halfway up and stuck, all right, then I'd be wanting to know whether he can go more, act he obviously can't actively lift up. I want to see if passively he can, he can go further. In that scenario, what I might do is put my hand on the scapula and lift it up further, okay? Now, what I'm doing when I put my hand on the scapula is I'm feeling where the scapula moves with him, okay? Now, the hip examination, one of the most important tests in the hip examination is Thomas's test. Have you heard about that? Okay, and that's because in a young kid, because the lumbar spine is so flexible, they can have basically a completely stiff hip, and yet it feels like the thigh is moving normally because what's happening is the hip, the lumbar spine is moving so well. Same thing can happen in the shoulder, okay? If this shoulder is stiff, the scapula will move with it, will move for it. So if I treat, on to, later on this afternoon, we'll take your theatre and fuse your shoulder, how much movement do you think you'll have? If we fuse your glenohumeral joint. Not much. Zero. <laughs> Zero? Well, no. Who, who thinks we'll have some movement? Oh, oh a bit of movement, because the scapula will Scapula will move. Yeah. Who thinks we'll get like here? Yeah. Or here? or here. So they get to here, because what happens, you, if we didn't move the whole thing, uh, I'll, I'll try and do it, because I'll hence my shot. What happens, you move your whole shoulder blade with it. So people can get up to here, and get up to here, and it's the whole shoulder blade's moving forward. So when you, when you actively can't lift it, what I'm doing is put a hand on a shoulder blade to see if the shoulder blade's moving. And if it starts moving straight away, we're thinking stiff leaning hemal joint, okay? And that's on forward flexion. And if you have a totally stiff shoulder, you can still lift it stiffly in the and you still lift it up there and up here. What you can't do, once we fuse your shoulder, what you won't be able to do is be able to do that because forward flexion, the scapula can come with it. Abduction, the scapula can swing, but externally rotating, the rib cage stops it. Okay? So you can't externally rotate. So a good test to see if the glenohumeral joint is stiff is actually get them to do external rotation. So forward flexion, we did active, he's 
before had good movement, but if he didn't, I'd see if as passively he did. And if actively and passively he was stiff, I'd be thinking, stiff, stiff joint. We then test it on abduction, turn to the face the way, and a bit more. Now we'll come around this side here. So uh, when you abduct, we won't do it on your left shoulder here. When we abduct, just turn a bit more around a bit, put a hand on the scapula and, and take arm up. So take arm out the side. Oh, okay. No, 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 just purely abduction. So oh, palm right. out, go as high as you can go that way. Now there he's got 180 degrees of motion, but if he was stiff and he came back down, I'd see if the scapula moved earlier. And then, we, and then we can do internal rotation, which I showed before. Probably not as useful, it's actually one of the most limiting factors, but the most important one for testing, turn around again, is do external rotation. Take quick arms to his side and external rotate. And he's got good external rotation. If again, if he couldn't move past there, let's see if passively he could. Now, if actively he couldn't move, but passively I could move it, it would suggest that the tendons weren't working or the nerve wasn't working. Okay? So it's either referred pain from the neck or for radiculopathy from the neck, which is less common, or it would be a major, major rotator cuff tear, more common. Come off his motorbike, ripped his tendons apart, he couldn't do these movements actively, but passively we could do them. Okay? He might be sore when we did them passively, but he could still do them. If, however, actively and passively he can't move it, I'm thinking stiff linear humeral joints. And of that, rotator cuff problems, tendonitis, bursitis, rotator cuff tear, secondary arthritis, Secondary arthritis might be it. Of the arthritic conditions, could be it. Frozen shoulder could be it. So frozen shoulder or rotator cuff. If actively and passively it was stiff, you think stiffly in a human joint, it's either arthritis or frozen shoulder. Actively and passive, actively is poor, but passively is good. We're thinking tendinopathy, so tendon tear or neuro, uh, referred pain for the neck. Um, and if he's got full movement, we're thinking it's probably, we know it's not arthritis, we know it's not frozen shoulder in the later stages and we're thinking maybe it's a rotator cuff problem. All right? So, when we, so we, we've looked, we've felt, and we do motion, okay? Forward flexion is, is full in, this, in the tree's case. If, however, he said, but my problem is when I get my arm up here, it starts hurting in this range, okay? That's a painful arc. What does that make you think of? Impingement. Impingement, yeah. which is rotator cuff problems, which is tendonitis and burst, or bursitis. So it's called, the stages of rotator cuff is bursitis, which is basically the lining of the tendon gets inflamed, um, which is really more of an early tendinopathy and the lining just got inflamed. Or tendonitis, which is when you're older, the tendon starts degenerating, just like we talked about with the tendonitis in the wrist. Or if, if it's a lot older or genetic factors or a heavy smoker, the tendon goes on a tear, it's tendon tear. So if you've got an early small, if you've got bursitis, tendonitis or small tear, you get a full movement but a painful arc. Okay, and if you've got a painful arc, we're thinking, we're thinking a, uh, a bursitis or tendonitis or a small tear. If, it's a, if he's got poor active motion but good passive motion, we're thinking big tendon tear or referred pain for the neck. Okay, and that, that painful arc will be in this range here. Okay, and it can be forward flexion or abduction can have it, but it's usually a combination of the two that gets the classic one. Okay, yeah. if he has, oh, I'll give him a full movement, is that pain in range of motion? We're thinking AC joint arthritis, okay? Because AC joint is when the, it really kicks in at the end range, and that, if that's sore, and he said, oh, it's really locally tender over the sore AC joint, and he had a lump there, we're thinking AC joint arthritis, and he's got secondary pain, pain at the end range of motion, okay? Now, if actively he's got, good mo got poor motion and passively he's got good motion, we might want to test his strength. So then we go to, from look for a move, we go to our special test, strength testing. Okay. Now, there's a uh, what muscles make up the rotator cuff to test strength? Uh, supraspinatus, supraspinatus, subscapular. And teres minor. Okay. Teres minor. I think people are putting more emphasis on it recently, but really, it's one of those muscles that does bugger all. Really, it's um, it's in a, it's external rotator. People think it's more important than I than I put credit on it, but it never tears really, and it doesn't really do a lot of functions. So yes, it's one of the muscles, but we really focus on the other three. Okay, and how do we test supraspinatus? Well, that's initiation of abduction. So we put your arm in this position, hold it there and push up against me. Supraspinatus is good, just initiation. Okay, how do we test uh, infraspinatus? Well, it's external rotation power. Push against me, keeping your elbow by your side, push against, infraspinatus. How do we test subscapularis? Well, that's internal rotation. Usually we put it with the arm elbow forward and pull into the test that's called belly press test. Okay, it's good subscapularis, you can do push-off test from the bottom, that's called Gerber's lift-off test. 
You might see these things on other videos online, but these are the more important ones, okay? So we can test muscle strength there. Okay, you're gonna have the videos, so you better, I hope you're not upset if you're not taking notes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but guys, you're taking notes for them, aren't you? So, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so we've got muscle power in those areas, okay? Um, so that's how we test, so that's our special test. What other special tests can we do? We can test for impingement, okay? The classic one is to bring your arm out in this position here and roll it in. You can do it abducted or usually across the chest and abducted and we're feeling for pain if it reproduces pain in the subacromial space. Okay, and that's called Hawkins impingement test. Or impingement sign. Impingement test is when you put local anesthetic in there and actually the pain goes away. Okay, um, so there are special tests. So by just doing a look, feel, move, we've got most of our answers. Okay, if there'd been a Fracture, do you want to sit down for a sec? Oh, I'm fine. Uh, do you want me to sit down? Yeah, you, you, we're done, I think. We'll, right, we'll sit down. Okay. You can sit down <laughs> for a sec. Okay, so we'll go through, I might get you back up for one little bit more, but I'll go, that's the instability issues, but we'll talk about. So by, by purely looking, feeling, and moving, we know right at the start, I know if there's a neck problem, okay, and, I'm, and I've got a suspicion of that because they're an older person, they've got some, maybe some referred pain in their hand, okay. If they're looking for a, if they've got full range of motion, but they've got a painful arc, I'm thinking it's a bursitis, or if they're older, tendonitis. If they've got full range, if they've got full pa um, passive range of motion, but reduced active range of motion, I'm thinking big cuff tear, but maybe a nerve entrapment, but probably big cuff tear. Okay. If they've got reduced active and passive motion, I'm thinking stiff glenohumeral joint, of which frozen shoulder or arthritis are the main causes. All right. And I can test the muscle strength by testing muscle, by muscle power. I can test for impingement. If they've got pain in range of motion, they've got a bit of a lump at the AC joint, I can test for, for in range of motion. Another special test for an AC joint is actually pull apart test, which I don't find that positive. You, you pull your hands together and pull apart, it's supposed to cause some pain. Or putting your arm across your chest can cause pain. The usual best test, I think, for AC joints is putting the arm in this position, adducted with the elbow straight and pushing up against resistance, and it can cause some pain at the AC joint. Okay, I don't know if that's on Melek's original video, but that's actually a good test. But usually knowing that there can be pain at that range, at that point, in range of motion, um, so there's a lump there, it's painful there at the AC joint, the in range of motion will help you. What I didn't mention is actually where the pain is that might also affect you too. One thing to be, pain in the front of the shoulder makes you think of glenohumeral joint. Pain laterally is where subacromial pain occurs, so it's where rotator cuff problems. Okay, pain at the AC joint is AC joint. And pain felt at the base of the neck or at the medial border of the scapula is usually referred from the neck. So classic, I don't know if any of you had a right neck, I used to get lots at your age, um, and you get pain down the medial border of the scapula and it's awful and you're, it's a terrible searing pain. Frozen shoulder pain is more at the front along with glenohumeral joint stiff arthritic pains. Okay, so that covers most of, you know, so a patient comes in, they've fallen off their, their push bike, and they've got a deformity on their clavicle, and they're sore in their clavicle, you're thinking, it's a fractured clavicle, <laughs> okay? You, you look at it, and you see the deformity, you feel, you can feel a, you feel a bit of a lump there. You might set, test for sensations part of it as well. Um, you, then you go for your active, your range of motion exercises, but your moment it starts to move, it's sore, and you back off. You get it, you're thinking fractured clavicle, you get an x-ray, you know the answer. Likewise, they fall and they've got a lump at their AC joint, you're thinking just look at the AC joint, okay? They come in, like well, I saw one patient, I've mentioned a hundred times to everyone, I saw a guy who had come in, was supposed to have had a traumatic start presentation, had been putting clothes in the boot of his car and felt something go in his shoulder and the GP had done an ultrasound suggesting a cuff tear and someone would wonder whether he had an acute cuff tear, which is probably another traumatic presentation but not as common. He came in, he looked unwell. I'd see, it happened actually on that day of that really big blackout years ago and um, he'd been closing his route in the middle of the rain and the big, big blackout that affected the whole of South Australia. And he, um, he took, I saw him a couple of days after that and he had this pain all around his shoulder. Okay, the GP was worried about an acute cuff tear because the ultrasound had shown a cuff tear. I looked at him and he just looked unwell. I went to shake his hand and he couldn't even touch, move it at all. It was just exquisitely tender. And I thought, something's not right here. You know, acute cuff tear wouldn't normally be this bad. 
and you know he doesn't have enough trauma to make me think of a fracture or dislocation, which would be you know if he was if he had fallen over, he'd be thinking of a broken bone or dislocated joint. He was so sore. So I thought on my list, I thought let's take his temperature. His temperature was 37.8. Okay, he just looked a bit you know glazed. So I sent off some bloods and rang Flinders at the time and said I got a registrar who didn't know me and um, said um, look I think this guy's got septic arthritis. He's uninsured. He needs to be washed out. And they said, OK, well, we'll see him if you think so, but he's probably not, because he hadn't any injections or surgery. Sure enough, his CRP came back at 400. So just by following my little list, I saw one of the rare diagnoses, probably the second time in my whole career for that scenario. But just because I knew those simple things, OK, it didn't quite fit the picture, I thought this, this could be worried. Now, if it hadn't been a septic arthritis, at least it's better that we overcall it than undercall it, but I was spot on. So. Traumatic presentation is not that hard, okay? Fracture dislocations and just think of infection occasionally. You can get tendon ruptures, okay? Elective conditions, depends on when you see them, we look and check out all these other structures. Okay, look, feel, move, and look at those range. Now the only other thing is dislocations, okay? So a classic dislocation, the story is pretty obvious. They've gone for a mark at footy, they've, been, they've fallen off their push bike, They've um, been playing wrestling, or maybe they've been assaulted, right? Um, and they've had their arm twisted around them. Another one to be aware of is a, is a seizure, an epileptic seizure, where they can often occur, they go into spasm, like posterior dislocations with an epile epileptic seizure. So, so you're thinking of traumatic scenario and the shoulders popped out of joint. Now, if they've got a history of recurrent dislocations, usually they'll come in and tell you it's dislocated, but maybe the first time you'll go to examine them, the shoulder will look deformed, they'll be holding it protected, and they don't want to move it at all. Okay? Um, an x ray will show you, you'll think of a dislocation because of the deformity, an x ray shows the answer. Okay? But if they have recurrent instability, and they keep saying, my shoulder keeps popping out, that's when you might want to do an examination to assess that as well. And again, it's still a look, feel, move, all of what we've already done already. But you want to check a few other things. And what goes on with recurrent instability is, I think the most, one of the most important tests, which you'll again probably do it at the end, but not to forget, is ligament laxity. Because people who dislocate their joints usually have a bit of ligament laxity. Some will have what we call multi-directional instability, so all the ligaments are lax and can stretch out really well. Um, but others will just have some minor ligament laxity. But most people who dislocate their shoulder have got a little bit of instability laxity. And that the ability to hop extend their thumbs and put it, you know, with flexion of the wrist and the thumb, they get it almost back on their wrist, on their forearm, sorry. Hop extend their fingers, hop extend their elbows, hop extend their knees. Okay? So that's always worth considering at the end of it. But when you go to assess the shoulder, there might be a few special tests to do. Okay? And that would be looking for apprehension signs. Now, a lot of people at the Royal Aid do it when they're standing. I, I'd like to do it when they're sitting or lying. And I'll just um, this might be a borrowed tree for a second, again, okay. and someone's going to actually hold the video. Sit on the side of the bed, and just sit there for us. So we're looking for signs of instability. What I do is I get is usually sitting, sit back a bit on the bed so you're nice and relaxed, and put your arms, the forearms on your on your lap. And we just, I usually tend to pull on the arms, and what we're looking for is a sulcus sign. Now you won't see it when I'm dressed, but you will see like a little divot where the subacromial spaces and it just opens up. And if they've got a little bit of instability particularly inferior instability, that woken up quite well, okay? All right, we then get them to lie flat. These are the special tests for instability. And we do, and come around this side, just do belotment to see if the shoulder feels like it's gonna pop out a joint, you know, basically trying to sublux it. I don't find this test supposed to be more pain in the internal rotated position when you bring the arm across the chest. So, um, and to be honest, I, I, I hardly ever do it. But you need to know it for the OSCE, maybe. <laughs> they might ask you for it, okay? And there's a good video online for that. Other, other, other parts I've missed out? How are we going for time? Must be almost nine. Yeah, was that perfect? All right. So I'll turn the video off so you feel comfortable asking a question. It's that useful because it's actually quite hard to assess it, but there should be about a 50% translation of the shoulder there. You've never dislocated your shoulder, no, by no. the way. Okay. <laughs> then that's looking for just generalised laxity as well. Then we can do posterior jerk tests where we bend the elbow, push it up, and try and, try and sublux the shoulder posteriorly. And that's looking for posterior instability. These are all the minor tests. Probably the most important one is apprehension. And you can do this standing up as well, where we put the arm and you're abducted, 
external rotator position and put a force, forward force on the arm to try and basically sublux it because that's the instant position of instability where it can dislocate. If he, and if he says, oh, that feels a bit unstable and a bit worried, you put it back and put pressure on the arm and, oh, that feels better. Okay, you let go, oh, I'm a bit worried again. And that's apprehension sign. What you don't want to do is dislocate the joint. Though. So that's basically it. <coughs> so a shoulder examination with that simple little group of tests is actually fairly straightforward. There's not much more to it. Um, you'll work out your own special tests. I know in the, um, you probably never see this done in the clinic because I don't see any of the registrars ever do it, but I know in the online one they talk about checking for um, a uh, push-off test off the wall, looking for winging of the scapula, that's worth knowing about as well. So I know it's in the list. To be honest, it's probably more of a paediatric test, but it is working, looking for long thoracic nerve injury and um, um, checking that the actual, um, the uh, muscle stabilizing structures are working fine around the scapula. Is there anything else you might have read in the, on the online or seen online? Um, the MD CAN test. MD CAN test, yeah, first looking for, um, that's, well that's really supraspinatus muscle power, is that what you're talking about for MD CAN? Yeah, There's, there is O'Brien's test, they talk about for sca uh, scap um, label tears, and that's actually in the MD CAN type position, but across the, across the chest, is the most unreliable test of the lot. Um, I think if you're worried about a label tear, and let's put label tears in perspective, because I'll probably make mention of it on Tuesday. A label tear is, remember the, the glenoid is a very small shallow socket, okay? It's one quarter the size of the humeral head. Now I like to think of it, if you try and run across the oval carrying a soccer ball, or holding a hand like that, it's actually quite hard, no matter how good you are at balancing. It's quite hard to run a sprint and keep the soccer ball balanced on your hand. If you put a, a catcher's mitt on it, like a baseball glove, it's much easier, okay, because you've increased the size. Now that's what God or nature, or whatever you want to believe, has done to the glenoid, okay? He's put the soft tissue labor, he, she or she, he or she's put the soft tissue around the, labor, around the glenoid to make it the labrum, to make this, the ball more stable but also allows it to stretch out in certain positions. When you dislocate your shoulder, you stretch part of that labrum and usually rip it off the edge of the glenoid, okay? And it either doesn't, usually doesn't heal very well, it heals, either heals medially, <laughs> and, um, and so when the ball sits there, it just wants to fall forward, or it, heals, it doesn't heal at all and there's a gap, and that's why the shoulder becomes inherently unstable. When we do surgery, if the rest of the socket's okay, we, we repair that tissue back to it, if the socket's been damaged or if there's a high risk, we might put a bit of bone to supplement it on that. So it's called a latter day. So one's an anatomical repair, the other one's a more of a salvage type procedure. Okay? Um, and basically, a label tear, sometimes people get dislocation of their shoulders or they may get label tears just purely from the biceps, which attaches, long-headed biceps, attached to the top of the glen uh, labrum, pulling on it, can tear the labrum and can lead to some instability. Now, the classic one that causes the problems are called the superior label tear, where they may get pain when throwing and they feel like something catches in their shoulder. Um, to be honest, about 20 years ago, someone diagnosed, diagnosed these label tears as a cause of pain, and for a long time, in fact, even now, I still get referrals saying that we can't find the cause of pain, we think it's a label tear, it needs to be repaired. And we all thought that these label tears were important and needed to be repaired. Now, a lot of label tears, like a lot of other soft tissues, are just incidental findings. So as you age, the labrum degenerates anyway, and it's just an incidental finding in it. But we also know that a lot of the label tests we found on investigations with MRI weren't there, so there's a false positive for investigations. And the O'Brien test looking for label tests was also quite, is not unreliable as well. So not only is the test unreliable, but the investigation's unreliable. When you find the label tear in theatre, it may actually be incidental anyway. Um, and we also know that when you repaired them, not only did it not always help the pain, but sometimes it led to some secondary stiffness. So while we went from a period of saying these label tears cause pain and need to be repaired, we now think, you know, if you have a classic story where someone's had a label tear from the history, and maybe their O'Brien's test is positive, and their MRI scan might confirm it, that's the one that a label tear is important for. But in general, most label tears or incidental findings aren't so important. And you'll find actually a lot of doctors now, rather than repair the labrum, they just release the biceps from the labrum and reattach it outside the shoulder, called a tenodesis. So, that's more of an education for you for the future, because when you're a GP, you'll be worried about label tear, but really it's becoming less and less important. But the O'Brien's test is a test for it, which is actually unreliable. <laughs> um, but you should know how to do it, and, and it is basically done, basically supposed to be more pain in the internal rotated position when you bring the arm across the chest. So, um, and to be honest, I, I, I hardly ever do it. But 
you need to know it for the OSCE, maybe. <laughs> they might ask you for it. Okay? And there's a good video online for that. <laughs>